Poor, poor Duke. Good day. For many years, people had been waiting for Duke Nukem forever. Twelve years it took for another Duke Nukem first-person shooter to be released. Now, in the intervening years, there had been a wide variety of other Duke Nukem games created, such as Duke Nukem A Time to Kill, which was a third-person shooter for the N64, which was the only other game, other than Duke Nukem 3D, that I actually completed, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. But to be perfectly honest, I didn't even know there was a Duke Nukem forever being developed. After Duke 3D and Duke Nukem A Time to Kill, I kind of moved on from the Duke Nukem franchise to the Shadow Warrior franchise, which, to be perfectly honest, I prefer to Duke Nukem. Now, really, Duke Nukem Forever was one of those legendary games that no one ever thought was going to be released. And, well, many of us probably would have liked Duke Nukem Forever to not have actually been released because of what we got. Duke Nukem himself has a pretty huge fan following, even on AlternateHistory.com of all places, where somebody actually made an alternate timeline where Duke Nukem Forever was released on time. And really, it doesn't change gaming history all that much, unfortunately. But today, we are going to take a look at Duke Nukem Forever and see just what went wrong. Now, first and foremost, this version of Duke Nukem was actually started in 2007 and was nearing completion in 2009. And the graphics, of course, reflect this. Now, Gearbox themselves only actually added multiplayer and console versions and did not actually muck about with Duke Nukem, as far as I know. Meaning, we don't actually get to blame them for this Duke Nukem abomination, but we can still hate them for that alien colonial marines one! Now, the graphics, well, of course, around 2007-2009 level, still look halfway decent even today. Sure, there's a lot of O-Res textures, and the level design is very simplistic, but I have, of course, seen a great deal worse. So we should be thankful for the small favors. Now, this game does like to railroad you quite a bit, but there are some instances, although they are very few, where you actually get to do a little bit of exploration, and the levels are not all that straightforward some of the time. In fact, there were parts of the game where I was definitely getting a great Half-Life vibe, although these moments were very few and far between. Now, the enemies actually look pretty damn good. This is where the graphics actually go to about 2011 levels, and they are nicely detailed, and they look like they have a bit of weight behind them. One other common complaint that has been mentioned by many a reviewer is the fact that Duke's arms don't actually move in the mirror. And yeah, that is kind of lame, Duke, especially when one considers that Doom Guy's arms could move in Doom 3. Hmm, no wonder that doomed space marine in Duke Nukem 3D had his arms ripped off. One other common complaint is the fact that Duke no longer has his Mighty Boot. Now, the Mighty Boot itself is a cool concept when you talk about it, but in terms of gameplay, the Mighty Boot was pretty bloody useless. It had very short range, it did next to no damage. Really you might as well have just been using bad language. Now, in Duke Forever, that has been replaced by executions, and while these aren't actually all that useful, they do look cool, and well, that is indeed their purpose. The graphics for the guns look a bit cartoony, and the gun themselves are actually, well, kind of lame, Duke. Honestly, I never really liked the weapons in Duke Nukem 3D all that much. There never just was one weapon that you could depend on, like the old reliable shotgun in Doom. Now, the first weapon in the game you actually get is the Trooper Blaster, which is a new weapon to the Duke franchise, and it uses three-round bursts and is a decent weapon all around. And it makes more sense for the foot soldier to actually drop this upon dying instead of pistol ammo like in Duke Nukem 3D. Now, the next weapon is Duke's trusty 1911A1. Now, in other games, he either had a Glock or a Desert Eagle. But it looks like he finally decided to use the one true weapon. The weapon made by the prophet of the firearm gods, John Moses Browning. So, with the holy weapon of John Moses Browning, you can smite your foes with its cleansing lead. But in all seriousness, it's a pistol. It's not even the M6D pistol, and is thus pretty bloody useless. Now, the next weapon you end up getting is the shotgun, and the shotgun is pretty bloody nice. Does a good amount of damage, and this is pretty much the standard weapon you're going to be using throughout the game. The only problem, though, is the fact that it does not have any range whatsoever. 
So if you're engaging enemies past two feet, you might well just drop back to the pistol because you ain't hitting shit. The other weapons in the game are decent enough, but then again, they don't actually stand out all that much. You can definitely see this game has had a very protractive development cycle, mainly because it introduces a railgun after railguns have been done to death. The railgun here works exactly like the Quake 2 railgun, and you know what? It would have been cool if it had been released around the time that railguns were brand new. Now it's just kind of blasé. The chain gun returns, and well, it works well enough, but it chews through ammo far too fast, and well, this is a good ranged weapon, but taking on large groups of enemies with it is somewhat problematic, seeing as how it takes about half a magazine to drop one enemy. New weapons that have been introduced to the game don't really feel new all that much. Mainly, they just feel like weapons that were new about 10 years ago. Now, one of the biggest problems that many people had was the fact that Duke Nukem used that dumb two-weapon rule. Even Miracle of Sound had a lyric in his song, Duke, you used to be cool, complaining about it. Thankfully, though, this two-weapon rule was actually removed at some point, and now if you enable it in the options menu, you can use four, which, while not great, is at least a damn sight better than two. Now, the other big issue people had with the game was the fact that you no longer had a health meter. Now, while I hate regenerative health and all it stands for, Duke Nukem actually makes it work. Back in Duke 3D, you often would take metric short tons of damage if you encountered extremely powerful enemies, and you had to collect health kits like a bastard. It was really one of those extremely hard games from the 90s where you could go from full health to zero health in a single bloody second. So really all DNF does is cut out the middle end. Here, just like in the past, you can indeed go from full health to zero health in one bloody second. And so instead of hunting down multiple health kits, or reloading the save every four seconds, you just hide behind some cover. Which actually is a little less tedious. And yeah, I know I'm sticking up for old Duke yet again, but oh well. The Ego Meter is also a fairly interesting concept and is in keeping with the somewhat humorous nature of the franchise. I say somewhat because, as we will find out later, DNF decides to get dark. The Ego Meter can also be increased by doing piddly crap. And, well, thank the great Space Dragon, you can still do piddly crap in this game, as that was a major aspect of Duke Nukem 3D. So what went wrong? The gameplay and graphics are decently made, and certainly nothing to cause people to want to scream "God for the blood god and charge with rusty chain axes. So really, what caused this game to be consigned to the rubbish bin of history? Well, unfortunately, it's that age-old issue, padding. When Duke gets to kill an It's a Duke sequel that we may not have wanted, but at least it was not complete shit. Sadly, Duke does not get to the killing all that often. If he did, the game would be extremely short, and then people would have complained about that. Really, the game is saddled with extreme amounts of padding. The first big bit of padding is driving segments. Literally, when the game starts up, you actually end up getting quickly into a driving segment that goes on and on and on, and the game really kind of teases you with, Hey, would you like to shoot these guys? Would you like to shoot these guys? Well, fuck you! You gotta drive around in this little RC car. And this isn't the only bad part of the game. Oh no, there are many other driving segments all throughout the game. Also, there are, of course, turret segments. Now, back when turret segments were new, they were kinda cool, I suppose. But Duke Nukem Forever wasn't really a turret shooter. Duke 3D was all about shoot, shoot, and shoot some more. Not just sit in one static location and shoot at the same few guys that show up. Really, turret segments have always been kind of boring. It takes a very special game to make them actually seem somewhat fun. Because you have to remember, when you're stuck on a turret, all you're doing is shooting at maybe one static target that maybe has one or two attacks. This is not at all like a legitimate boss fight where you actually have to use legitimate tactics. Really, I would like to liken this game not to a train wreck, but a train with a very bad coal shoveler. You know, the game gets going, the train's chugging along, and then the coal shoveler guy's arm gets tired and the game just comes to a screeching halt 
Then he relaxes a little bit, and then he starts shoveling more coal onto the fire, and the train keeps going, and then his arm gets tired yet again. Really, it's the padding that completely kills Duke Nukem Forever. This is not a bad game, and there is in fact a good game in Duke Nukem Forever. It's just the sheer amount of padding that really blinded everyone to the, if not diamond in the rough, then at least uh, gold in the metal slag. Well, that was pretty bloody depressing, but you know what's even more depressing? Duke Nukem gets drunk after one beer, and that's pretty bloody sad when even I, your illustrious general, can drink one without getting drunk. Observe. Much better. And now with that little bit of liquid courage, let's take a look at its story. Upon further review, the game's story, while not bad, is badly designed. And what I mean by that is, the developers probably set out with a good idea in mind, but sadly that idea wasn't good. What I mean is, if you're setting out to build the worst weapon in the world, you're still building the worst weapon in the world. So, with Duke Nukem, I believe they set out to make a parody of modern games. And, well, they succeeded, but they didn't succeed in the right way. This is not a light-hearted or friendly parody of modern gaming. Rather, it's a very mean-spirited parody that, well, just makes everyone involved in Duke Nukem Forever seem kind of like an asshole. Basically, every character in the game is a complete asshole, except for maybe the general character. Duke Nukem himself is in top form as chief asshole, but everyone else tries to out-asshole him. Just listen to this. I just got back from helping my friend find his wife. Christ, what a fucking pussy. I get that that is supposed to be funny, and it's supposed to be parodying over-the-top dialogue seen in modern games. Unfortunately, it's just really cringeworthy. It shows that the developers... Well, had the mindset of the people behind those bloody scary movie abominations, because that's exactly what this game feels like. Now, the overall plot for the game is as bog standard as they come, as you would expect. It's the same old plot of aliens invade, Duke, go save. You wouldn't expect anything but that, but just the way it's executed just feels so lame, unfortunately. The thing is, when you're trying to craft a parody, you really need to have some respect for that which you are parodying. When you don't put any effort other than, Haha, everyone does this, that is stupid, you're not really making the case for your own game. You don't really have a good identity of your own when you do that. It's just, well, okay, Duke Nukem in Save the World from Aliens. I'm not feeling the humor. I'm just feeling like the people behind this game were mad at everyone else making successful modern games that they just wanted to throw a big fuck you to everybody, and they really did a good job at that, at least. <sighs> the game itself starts up with Duke fighting the boss from the end of the third episode of Duke 3D. Although, question, where the fuck did these chuckle fucks come from? They weren't in Duke 3D. Also, where in the name of Grimnir's beard are all my weapons? At this point in Duke 3D, you had, well, all the weapons in the game, and shitloads of ammo. Now all I get is a Devastator with only 69 rockets! Ah, ha, 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 ha! Where is the blimp of ammo? Oh wait, there's a blimp, but is it filled with ammo? No, it's not. Really, this was a pretty cool boss fight in Duke 3D. Unfortunately here, it's not done all that well. Mainly, while it's supposed to be parroting modern day boss fights, it just is, well, a modern day boss fight. You circle strafe the boss, and, well, run out of rockets. A plane flies in, drops more rockets, and repeat. Wow. I am laughing. I am in stitches. And then we find out that Duke Nukem is actually just playing a game of Duke 3D. I would say Dukeception, but this is kind of sad. In Duke Nukem's universe, Duke 3D actually kind of sucks. You then, of course, go on a complete Duke ego trip where everyone fawns over him quite a bit. And well, this is an interesting concept. In practice, well, you kind of just want to play the game and not just, well, stand there while people watch a TV. 
Now eventually, you can indeed get started with the game proper. How do you do that? Well, you go to the Duke Cave! Right after pandering to some asshole sitting on Duke's throne. Why Duke doesn't just punch him in the face and throw his carcass out a window, I don't know. While in the Duke Cave, you get your first taste of fighting and killing, and it's good. Eventually, you work your way outside and do more killing. And then, of course, after all that killing is done and you start getting into the game, you get to the Duke Dome. This is the part of the game that others also complain about, and quite rightly indeed. It's absolutely horrible. Really, it sucks the fun out of the game, and is really fucking depressing to boot. All the women are too far gone to save, and well, yeah, Duke loves his babes. I love my babes. Too bad you can't do anything to actually save them, and just, just listen to this. <laughs> so yeah, the Duke Dome, ladies and gentlemen. This is actually one of the more depressing moments in games. Too bad it's an a Duke Nukem Forever game! A game that is supposed to be wacky and zany. There is nothing wacky and zany about women crying and crying out in pain. Now, after this horrible level is over, the game gets back to being zany and cool. Unfortunately, by the time you actually finish the Duke Dome, you just want to delete the game and never look at it again. Really, if this one level hadn't been in there, I think even the most die-hard of Duke Nukem Forever haters might have at least had a grudging respect for Duke Nukem Forever, but this level just is the final nail in the Duke Nukem coffin. And so that is Duke Nukem Forever. Now before we call it a video, let's actually take a look at its DLC, which, surprisingly enough, isn't complete shit. So yeah, while the base Duke Nukem Forever is complete shit, the developers decided to actually attempt to apologize to the fans and actually gave Duke a decent game. The Doctor Who cloned me is the DLC expansion pack and it's damn good. This is the bloody game that we all wanted. Oh sure, it still has a few modern gameplay elements, but the story isn't complete shit. The story actually is entertaining. And while Duke Nukem Forever was a horrible chore to get to, I actually found myself wanting to play the Doctor Who cloned me. We actually have a legitimate villain in the guise of Dr. Proton, who was the first villain in the Duke Nukem franchise. The gameplay is actually centered around first-person shooting? Whatever next! The enemies are actually, well, kind of cool. The graphics and level designs are actually kind of good. And this should have been the game from the get-go! Oh, Duke Nukem Forever. You know, millions of dollars were spent on that thing. Countless hours were wasted to make a game that is a little better than Colonial Marines. But you know what? A fan modding group thought they could do better. And in 2013, they did. While it is often said to always bet on Duke, I personally always bet on the fans. The fans are what actually make a franchise successful, and the fans actually care. And here is Duke Nukem 2013. This is a game that was actually programmed by a small number of programmers for free. And they made the Duke Nukem Forever we all wanted. And they did a damn good job. Sure, it doesn't have modern day graphics, but it has damn good gameplay. It has a fairly decent story and the driving sections are actually pretty bloody fun. But then again, that is to be expected when it comes to a fan-made work. Sure, the fans have limited resources and a limited time, and possibly even limited skill, but they always end up doing better than developers that have millions upon millions of dollars. Really, this is the Duke Nukem Forever that you should play indeed. It is everything we all wanted. And I personally cannot recommend it enough. So, all you gotta do is get a copy of the original Duke Nukem 3D, download the eDuke32 source port, download the mod, and you will be able to once again enter the world of FPS awesomeness. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is Duke Nukem Forever. A game that is not so horrible as it is disappointing. There's just enough good in that game to be disappointed that the whole game isn't like that. 
And really, I do recommend picking up Duke Nukem Forever not to play the base game, but to at least play that DLC, as it is definitely worth playing. And of course, I highly recommend playing that Duke Nukem Forever mod. But really, you don't have to stop there. Duke Nukem Forever is popular enough that he actually is featured in a wide variety of mods in other games. The two that come to my mind are Serious Nukem, a Duke Nukem mod for Serious Sam that turned Serious Sam 3 into the Duke Nukem Forever that, well, we would actually have wanted. And finally, there is a Duke Nukem mod for Left 4 Dead 2 that makes an already awesome game that much better. And so, I am General Ops, wishing you good Duke Nukem Zero Hour, and good Duke Nukem A Time to Kill, or whatever, makes you happy.